and why these messages are important. With each church, each church represents a group just like this church here. People just like you and I going to church on a Sabbath morning. Yes? We don't have anything on them, they don't have anything on us. Because in every single age, whatever the stresses of life are, it is for that particular age. And that's why it's hard for sometimes, because like for example, sometimes we think about Adam and Eve and we say, oh, but how, Adam can, how could Adam have done that when Eve ate the fruit? And then some people say, well, well how could have Eve even eaten from the fruit? Well, do you ever remember a time that you made a mistake and not just that backwards why you did that? Mm -hmm. It's the same that happened with them. Eve was beguiled. An error took place. And Adam, when he realized what was happening, the only woman he ever loved and that existed. I uh, yeah. <laughs> it was not an easy decision. And he did exactly what Moses would have done, and Moses offered to do it. He was willing to die rather than lose her. It was not so much that he did not want to go to God. He loved Eve. Moses loved Israel. Even though they murmured and complained, he was still willing to die for them. When Christ came, it's the same thing. You know, God looked at the earth during the Antilopian period. And in Genesis 6 and verse 5, he says that, and he looked upon the heart of man, and there were the thoughts were but sin continually. Do we have a concept of what it is to be having sinful thoughts continually? You don't have a break to think about something good. And in spite of that, what did God do? God swore to Moses. Moses built a ship. No. Tell the people what's going to happen. No. Sorry, not Moses. No. Noah. Yeah. Tell the people what's going to happen. He had Noah preach for 120 years. There was ample opportunity for people just like you and me to make the right choices. The animals, interestingly enough, The animals, unlike us, chose to go in the ark. Isn't that interesting? You know, they, have, they don't worry about transportation and they don't worry about the meals and all that kind of stuff. They don't even worry about clothing. Life is simple. The food is the grass or the leaves or the, or the fruits, wherever they, they come across. Them. When an animal sees another, he does say, hey, go for nothing close. Life is simple. There was a time when Adam and Eve were clothed with the righteousness of Christ. They never thought of themselves as being naked either. But the minute that sin entered, everything changed. And that's why the all or nothing concept is important. Because, and I'm saying this because I know it. I know that we have fallen off the bandwagon somewhere along the lines, and we need to get back on. Aren't there things that sometimes you do on Sabbaths that there was a time when you would, oh, how could we even think to do that? Don't, don't answer that. That's a rhetorical question. Aren't there things that you think about on the Sabbath at the time when you say, oh, that's, I can think about that another time? Little things start to creep in. That's how the devil starts. He starts small and he works his way up. Last time I remember the pastor was saying, you know, when you have a, a, a sermon for an hour, for a whole hour or and a half, people get tired. But you will go to a ball game or a basketball game, or in my case, watch tennis. For hours and hours and hours. And when it's finished, you're thinking, oh, man. It's been the next game coming on. That tells us that we have some issues. That tells me that they have some issues. Things that we need to work on and fix. 
we don't have to do it all by ourselves. In fact, we can fix ourselves. You know that, right? We can make choices. It is God who worked within us to do of His will and His pleasure. It's something that the Holy Spirit has to do from the inside out. And so that's why it's important for us to have that relationship with Jesus. So how is your relationship with God? Is it all that it can be or is it all that it should be? Is it nothing like what the Bible says it ought to be? <clears throat> Let's see what happened with some of the churches and how God went through that whole description of the churches starting from Ephesus all the way through to this year. And this is going to be very brief. This was the biggest challenge I had for a long time. Because there was so much that could be said, and I was wondering what not to say and what to say. But the Spirit right now is working. And my prayer is that whatever I do say is exactly what God will have had me to say. This is a map of the area in the times when we had Jerusalem and Caesarea and Antioch. You have the Mediterranean Sea. It's out there in Europe. We have Rome. We have Corinth. Athens, Philippi, and here is the province of Asia. And this is the area that we're going to be looking at. When we blow this map up, we see the seven churches in Asia. We have Ephesus, we have Smyrna, we got Pergamum, well, Pergamos or Pergamum. We have Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, the seventh church. The way the churches were set up, it became part of what was known as a natural mail route. So as they moved from place to place, churches were being established. And as the mail came through, it followed the same path. The names of the seven churches, according to the Acts of the Apostles, page 585 by E.D. the names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era, the number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. We are not going to focus too much on the symbols, but we will look at a couple of symbols. And I'm sure that by the time we finish today, some things you will remember. And I'm praying that you will. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 and 7, we start to look at the loveless church, the Ephesian church. Now, if we look at Revelation chapter uh, 1 and verse 9, I just want to revisit that just to connect the two. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. We are told, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos. And by the way, if we go back, Patmos is just here. This is where Patmos is. It was on the island of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Interestingly enough, uh, the whole uh, prophetic period for the trumpets and the seven churches actually coincide in terms of the periods in time. But that's the seven last trumpets, so that's another, another topic that can be discussed another time. Verse 11 I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so the first church we're going to look at then is the Ephesus church. And it said here to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And we have a little picture here to the right, bottom right. You see seven golden lampstands. And we see 
that he has in his hand seven stars. What do you do with a lampstand? You put a candle on the top of it and you light it. And the purpose of that is to do what? They say illuminate your way to give light. Yes? So each of these love signs represented the church. Seven churches. And the purpose of the church was to give, to spread its light, the light of God's love and his message to all the world. The seven stars represented the angels at each church. Now when we talk about angels, like for example the first angel, the second angel, they're talking about people who are mobilized to do a specific work. So we're looking at the leaders in those specific churches. Are you with me so far? I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Oh, that's good. God is saying that the people in his church, they are workers. They're taking it seriously. They hate evil. That's where we need to be. We need to hate the sin, not the sinner. Not the sinner. Because even God loves the sinner. He just hates the sin. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not. You use the Bible to test them. To see, if, for example, if they were speaking according to the word. Or if the word was based on the light that they have within them, which should be also reflecting Christ. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them liars. And you have pers persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Do not be weary in what? In well-doing. You're still going strong for the cause of Christ. Nevertheless, now here, when you start with nevertheless, you know that something's coming, right? <laughs> nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. You see, there was a time when they had such fervor that what they have now is still good, still measurable, but it's not anywhere near like what they had before. I compare the fervor that they now have with the way that uh, Houston's boat used to run 10 years ago as opposed to how he runs today. But then he thought he was fast, but he wasn't breaking our records. Not world records. Today, <coughs> nobody can beat him. Now, what if we flip that around? Back then, he was breaking records. Now today, he can't break any. In fact, maybe his records are getting broken by somebody else. Then he would have dipped, declined, yes? That's exactly what God is saying has happened with those who, has, who lost their first love. It has declined. Now, follow me here. When you decline in one way, what's that void being filled with? That's the question. You see, if God is not at the brim of your glass and there's a decline, what's taking up the rest of the space? We need to have the Holy Spirit to the brim to make sure that we can say that we know what's there. Anything else is going to be related to the devil and what he does. Remember, therefore, that you, where you were, from where you, from where you were, have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lamp, stand from its place, unless you repent. Mm. It's conditional. Same that happened at Nineveh <laughs> when God said when God said Jonah. Right? It was conditional. Right? But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans were a sect of people. And they did not believe in the divinity of Christ, they did not believe in the creation. Um, when they engaged in marriage, they married several, they had, they, they had, they had several wives, 
they even on occasion shared wives. <laughs> now, ladies, I don't think you'd want to live in those times. <laughs> but this was a group that God said that He hated. No, that's put in perspective. God loves the sinner, but He hates the sin. He didn't appreciate, didn't like what they were doing. Then in Revelation 2, 8 to 11, it tells us about the Smyrna church. So maybe, like the church at Ephesus, we had that first love and maybe it has been some. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit are we only able to get that back. But let's see now what Smyrna, God says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. And I like this. Because this is talking. These things says the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, who was dead, he died for our sins, and came to life. Christ is the firstborn of creation. Meaning that he was the first to die and the first to be resurrected from death, never to see death again. The first. Now Enoch was translated, he never saw death. So was uh, Elijah. 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 So Christ has the preeminence. I know your works, tribulation and property, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. <clears throat> the church at Smyrna was a very booming city. They were the nearest, what they called the Acropolis, was on the hill. And on that hill, they had several temples to various gods, including Zeus. So this place was a place where there's a lot of satanic worship going on. Because anytime that you engage in idolatry, it is satanic. Do not fear any of those which you are about to suffer. Those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. That you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. That's okay. When the three Hebrew brides, the Hebrew boys, were to be thrown in the fiery, the fiery furnace, what was their response? Now, first of all, did they really want to go in a fiery furnace? No. No. Let's be real here. <clears throat> but their faith says, because of that faith, hey, we are not going to bow down to that. So, if you want me to stand in here, we can do that. And if it is God's will that we survive, then God be praised. Yes. Right? But they were not going to back down. They were not going to bow down to some hunk of metal just because some man said so. <laughs> Good for them. We may not see hunks of metal today, but what are the idols? Is it the television set? Is it the clothing? What are the idols today that seems to have us bow down to them without us having to kneel on the floor. Do you see where I'm going with this? What's taking our time and our energies and distracting us from God? Is it that we overwork? And I will admit, I remember my wife once said to me that I have, she said it so nicely, you know, wives are great at saying things in a nice way. She said, you know, because you have a... Um, a propensity or a tendency uh, for to be a, to be a workaholic. <laughs> she was not telling me I was working too hard and too long. I had a tendency <laughs> <laughs> to be a to be a bit of a workaholic. You know, I was on the verge, <laughs> right? I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why every single year I try to make sure I take a vacation yes. because I like my students and I like work. But they're not going to take me into the kingdom. You've got it. Right? And I know that. 
And I also realize that if I don't slow down, there's something we call a little ticker, ticker in here, mm -hmm. part. We are hearing of people now who are dying in their 30s, just all of a sudden due to heart failure. Right? So where I put in my focus, I need to reevaluate that. It's an ongoing battle, but then life in and of itself is a battle. As long as we have the Holy Spirit, we will continue to be on the winning side. So don't fear tribulation. Don't fear it. Because you may come out as gold tried in the fire, in the furnace. Yes? Don't fear tribulation. Whatever God allows, He knows what you are going to go through. He knows what you will be going through. And He knows how what you are going to come through it. If you put your trust in Him. Then to the church at Pergamos. Pergamos is described as a compromising church. Mm -hmm. one, probably one of the reasons why um, I noticed that since I've been here, Elder uh, Thomas is always about evangelism. Do you all notice that? Mm -hmm. I've seen more training and seminars and, and I've been in the United States now since 1994. And this church does a whole lot when it comes to evangelism. And I'm glad to be a part of it. In all honesty. Because if we are not sharing that which we are getting, we will become stagnant. Nobody ever wants stagnant water. Alright? We need to share with others what God has shared with us. It also helps to keep us grounded. The more, the more we share, the better we share with others. It helps to keep us grounded. It helps us to come to grow in that grace and that love and that fervor with Christ as well. If we do nothing, if we don't confess God to men, will Christ be able to confess us to his Father? No. No. So we do need to be involved in evangelism. Some of that I've seen here that I don't see at a lot of other churches, even my own church. And I think you all know what I'm saying. But he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Another place where uh, they had a lot of satanic rituals and idolatry going on. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, was my faithful who was my faithful mother, was killed among you, where Satan dwells. All kinds of temples also in Pergamos. But I have a few things against you. Because you, ha you have there are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, mm -hmm. who taught Balaam to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel mm -hmm. to eat sacred, to eat things sacred to idols <laughs> and to commit sexual immorality Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Mm -hmm. Which thing I hear? Mm -hmm. It's the second time we have seen the Nicolaitans coming up. Mm -hmm. Remember what that group was involved in. Did not believe in, in the divinity of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Did not believe in creation. They, they were indifferent when it came to the whole discussion of <coughs> any kind of fornication or adultery. Because they had several wives and sometimes some of the wives were some of the same because of the way they arranged it. Repent or else I will come to you quickly. Don't compromise, church members. Don't compromise. Right? It is better for us to leave a situation than to compromise because of it. Especially where our, our salvation is at stake. And God says to us that we can work out our salvation with what? Fear. With yeah. fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. <coughs> and then from Pergamos, we go over to the church of Thyatira. 
And the angel of the church in Therapia, right, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the last are more than the first. The last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. Another problem with sexual immorality coming up here again. Do you notice the number of times the Bible talks about this particular sin? Sexual immorality. Which sin is it that you sin against your own bodies? The sexual immorality sin. My servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacred to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. Now if God is going to give Jezebel time, do you think he also gave Satan time? Before Satan was cast down? Of course. God is a fair God. God is willing that all should come to repentance. And if you repent, God will accept you back. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse. cleanse. When he says cleanse, it's like me when I'm on my whiteboard or what I used to call, or my blackboard back in the day. When I clean that board, you don't see white on the blackboard. When I clean that whiteboard, you don't see the blue ink and the red ink and all the other colors I use on it. It's as if it is as if the board had never been used. It's as if I have never committed sin. Now, wouldn't it be great that Christ could so come with his righteousness that when God looks at me, he doesn't even see a speck of sin? That when God looks at you, he doesn't see a speck of sin? That's where God wants to take us. Yes. That's the whole purpose of Christ doing all that he did. Just so that you and I can have salvation. <laughs> And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. But in verse 25, he says a little bit more, but in verse 25 he says, But hold fast what you have till I come. God wants us to hold on. Have you ever seen a picture with the girl cat? Yeah. on a rope, holding on for their life. God wants us to hold on to the Holy Spirit, to the faith that we had from the very beginning. Let's hold on for their life because once He gets to you, and He will, you're taken care of. Don't worry. Don't look down and see what's down there. Just keep looking at what you're holding on to. My faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit. Jesus, God, all those things are what you're holding on to. If we hold on to Christ, we will be well. All will be well with our souls. Amen. To the church of Sardis, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Again, the number seven, the completeness and the ability of God in terms of the Holy Spirit. To be everywhere all at once. I know your works. That you have a name. That you are alive. But you are dead. Now oh, help me here folks. You are alive. But you are dead. How can you be alive and be dead at the same time? If we are alive. To the things of this world. But dead. To the things of God. Spiritually. Then, in the final analysis, you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. 